just gonna let people in. Also, I'm gonna make sure that we meet right when we're not speaking. Yeah, that helps, that helps. It's just hard when you forget to unmute. <laughs> hmm. Totally. All right, people are coming in. I'm just gonna share my screen. And just live stream, and we'll get going. All right, can everybody see my screen okay? Thumbs up. All right, well, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us on this kind of gloomy Thursday night here. Uh, but we're talking about a really serious subject and we have some uh, incredible speakers here with us tonight to guide the conversation. This is recovery, that's dope. Uh, this is Elevate Northeast Community Conversation, our second or third of the year. Um, thank you all for being here and thank you to our Director of Community Outreach, Tashonda Vincent Lee for organizing this. Uh, we're gonna get right into the conversation today. So after a quick welcome, our, our speakers will introduce themselves, we'll have a discussion, and then we'll take any questions that we have coming from the audience, whether on this webinar or from the live stream on Facebook. So recovery, that's dope. Uh, Tashonda, why don't you go ahead and welcome everybody. Sure, thank you so much, Beth. Um, so I have the esteemed pleasure of introducing this panel of dope individuals, all pun intended, um, this evening. So we have some amazing thought leaders with us who are going to really, really dig into um, sort of the weeds, if you will, of cannabis and recovery. So first, I'd like to introduce the amazing Kiever Smith Bolden. Um, she's here with us from Connecticut. Um, and then we also have Dr. Marion McNabb, who's with us this evening, and she's also in the New England area. Everyone here is in the New England area, so that's great. Um, and then we have the amazing Tamika and Samson, um, who I have the honor of, of working with this evening and speaking with, and I'm really, really happy to have this opportunity. Um, so what I'd like to do is I'd like to give the ladies each an opportunity to introduce themselves. Um, and if you will, just share a little bit about your professional background so that the audience has an idea of who you are and sort of what brings you to this intersection of cannabis and health and recovery. Um, so we'll just go in order. Uh, Kiva, would you like to, to start? Sure. Hello, everyone, and thank you, Elevate Northeast, for inviting me uh, to have this very important conversation. Uh, my name is Kibra Smith Bolden. I'm a registered nurse. I hail from New Haven, Connecticut. Um, and I, um, long story short, I got into the cannabis industry after years of being a community based nurse um, because my grandmother suffered from an aneurysm. We medicated her with cannabis. We saw a complete turnaround in such a quick, short amount of time that, you know, as a nurse, I had never seen improvements like this with all those pills I was throwing at people. And so I decided to study cannabis. Of course, I'm from New Haven, which is the inner city in Connecticut. Um, but so I knew about weed, I knew about marijuana, but I never really knew about cannabis, never thought about it as medicine. And so I found a school in Massachusetts, North, Northeast Institute of Cannabis was its name and studied it. Um, I learned about the science, the medicine of cannabis, learned about the endocannabinoid system, which I had never even heard of. Um, but what really, really, got me engaged was learning about prohibition and what how the direct correlation that existed between all of my friends who went to prison or who were killed and a, a direct correlation to the prohibition of cannabis which was only prohibited because of who who was consuming it, not because of any social <laughs> uh, ails that it caused and, or any health uh, concerns or any traffic violation. I mean, it wasn't even a case back then. Um, and so, you know, really putting that together, I wanted to be a part of making sure that my community not only benefited 
by having access to this plant, plant-based medicine, but also that they were aware of the opportunities that could, could exist in this industry as business owners um, and worked very hard here in Connecticut on the legislation that we now have, which is, you know, a very, it has a nice social <laughs> equity element. Um, so I'm, I'm semi-proud of our legislation somewhat, um, but worked very hard on making sure that at least communities that were damaged by the war on drugs, destroyed uh, by the war on drugs, had an opportunity to rebuild and, re and recreate themselves with tax revenue from this industry. So that's in our legislation. We got people out of prison um, <laughs> who have convictions for that. That is in our legislation. We are able to expunge um, records. That's in our legislation. And we are able to create entrepreneurs who qualify as social equity um, individuals as business owners in this industry. And that is something that I'm extremely proud of. So that's who I am. Um, I'm still a nurse. I still work. I'm still very active in the community. I own a home care company as well. I employ people. And I, I just really love to educate people about cannabis and opportunities that exist. But just being able to elevate beyond where you are. That's really where I am in life. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kira. Kira, you summed it up perfectly. Um, this woman is on the front lines of everything in Connecticut, quite frankly, as it pertains to cannabis, um, as it pertains to legislation, as it pertains to actual equitable access, it, as it pertains to ownership, as it pertains to just everything cannabis and, and standing in the gap for those that honestly have come from those communities have that have been disproportionately harm is Kiba and you Kiba as a nurse like an actual registered nurse like the moment that I met you I had such awe for you because I was like wow like you're really putting a lot on the line but in that you're bringing so much value to your community so in our community um so I, I mean I'm honored to know you and to call you a friend for sure um thank so thank you, you for being here thank you, thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and so next, we're going to have Dr. Marion McNabb. Would you mind introducing yourself and sharing with the community a bit about you and all that you do and have done in this space and also in public health? Like, I, I yes. So please share with us. Uh, thank you, Tashonda. And it's so great to be here. Thanks to Elevate Northeast and to my fellow panelists, Kibra. Um, and Tamika, I'm really excited about our discussion tonight um, with a really important topic. Um, so I'm the president of the Cannabis Center of Excellence. It's a 501c3 nonprofit uh, cannabis research, education, and social justice organization based out of Massachusetts. I started um, in the industry. I have a background in global public health, working in HIV, AIDS, and maternal child health. Um, and family planning in the past and five years ago, um, started uh, researching and educating around cannabis um, in the Commonwealth. And uh, since then I've conducted six different uh, cannabis research studies together with UMass Dartmouth and other uh, colleagues at Ryder University. And one of the most striking data points that has come out um, when uh, even the first study and then every single study afterwards, uh, that has come out is that uh, the majority of the people who consume medical or adult use cannabis are, are reporting uh, doing so, trying to actively reduce uh, medication, uh, prescription medication use, um, and that includes opioids um, for a variety of conditions. So uh, from a public health perspective, I'm a public health doctor by training. So um, that's sort of red flags to raise um, and the need to kind of raise awareness about um, you know, uh, really doing this under supervision and clinical care um, and, and really trying to understand where, um, you know, we can provide a non-lethal alternative for people um, suffering these days. So, um, yeah, uh, like I said, run cannabis research studies, also run a um, cannabis training program together with licensed applicants um, that provides mentored experiential learning opportunities for folks negatively impacted by the war on drugs in Massachusetts. So I'm really excited to kick that off this year and, um, you know, really look forward to um, the panel tonight and discussing some of this really important uh, topic and how we can really drive a, drive a dent in um, the ongoing opioid epidemic. So thanks for having me. Thank you for being here with us. And, and 
And again, talking about another guy, uh, Kiba shared in the chat that we should give you a standing ovation. And, and I would like to take that moment to do that, not just for you, but for all of the women on this panel, um, because we're going to talk about all of your excellence and we're going to do our best to highlight it and highlight it in a meaningful way so that the community absolutely understands the value with which you bring to this conversation. So to have you here and to understand that the absolute fight when we talk about the state level, when we talk about the federal level right now is always what is research proven? And the issue is that those that research does not exist. So to have you here and to know that you're actually doing that work and to know that you are a a PI in this work and to know what that means, like it is absolutely phenomenal and such an honor to have you here with us, Doc. So, you know, I've, I yeah. fell in love from the first moment we sat down and we spoke. <laughs> so I'm, 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 I am happy to have you here and not just, you know, again, for, for this event, but for the value that I understand that this will carry on. So thank you so, 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 so much for all that you do. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Kira. Thank you, Tana. <laughs> thank you to the general. So last, but definitely not least, I had the pleasure of speaking with this young lady. Um, was it about two years ago we had a conversation at a conference? Um, it was. Yes, and, and I knew from the moment that we had that conversation that I was going to be seeing a lot of you and hearing a lot from you. And it has been absolutely um, a pleasure to watch you flourish um, and to see you grow in this space, but moreover to bring your breadth of knowledge and all that you have experienced and you've gained from your background into this industry, which is also gonna be, you're here, it's another gap that you're standing in. So Tamika, if you would please introduce yourself and share with us a bit more about who you are and what brings you to this space. Absolutely, thank you so much to Shonda. Thank you, Elevate, hi everybody. I'm Tamika Sampson, I'm a licensed addictions counselor and in, in that space for a little over 20 years. Um, most of the populations that I treat are some of the most vulnerable in my community, those that have substance use, those have mental health issues, medical issues, and also those that experience homelessness. So I've worked a lot in that population. Um, in, in that work that I've done with these clients, I was able to learn more about cannabis and how it's helping individuals in the opioid um, crisis. So that piqued my interest a little bit more and I started doing a lot of research. I came across the Cannabis Control Commission Social Equity Program um, back in 2020. And I was like, hmm, this might be a good way for me to find out more about how cannabis helps individuals medicinally. And I applied for the program. I was able to get accepted into the program because I also have family who has been victims of substance use, um, victims on, of the war on drugs. And I used that um, avenue to get into the program. And um, right now I am working on my cannabis delivery operation that I'm really, really proud of. Um, Kushcart is what I'm working on right now. We are gonna be located out on Cape Cod. So even though I'm still practicing as a counselor, a lot of my time and a lot of my focus is put towards this, this company and trying to get it up and running. Um, in addition to all of that, I also am taking a certification program in psychedelics and research as far as how can we use psychedelics to help individuals in mental health and to help individuals who are um, experienced in substance use as well. So right now I'm doing like a real learning curve. I'm learning, learning a whole lot about psychedelics and, and all of the really, really good benefits and the research that's coming along. And I have really high hopes to one day open up my own private practice. I'm in the works of doing that right now. And I wanna be able to incorporate everything that I've learned, all of my experiences, um, 
the information that I'm getting from the psychedelic space to be able to, you know, bring more help to people who are suffering. So. Thank you so much, Tamika. Again, um, I hope that everyone recognizes that we um, behind the scenes as directors, um, we're definitely, and, and, and also our team members, um, we were very intentional when we put together this panel. Um, we wanted to make sure that everyone who was here and who was speaking absolutely comes from a place of knowledge um, experience and make real life practice, basically, um, because we understand how important it is. And it's something that we don't take lightly um, because what we, you know, at Elevate, we're not necessarily advocating the use <laughs> of cannabis, but what we do believe in is that everyone has the right to the absolute and real information. Um, and though, and also sometimes based on where we all stand and where we all sit and where we all live, um, unfortunately access to such information um, can be difficult to, to actually like have and to get. So we wanted to make sure that we were doing all that we could to bring this information information to the communities that need it the most. So again, thank you ladies each for being here. Um, thank you so much for sharing with us who you are and all the work that you've done. Um, so we're going to get into our questions. Um, so I'm going to ask the first question, and it's going to go to Kibra. Kibra, I have a question for you. And all the work that you've done um, in the community as a registered nurse, and I know that you also have um, quite a bit of experience with working with those with mental and behavioral health issues and disorders. Um, something that I found really interesting when I, so full disclosure, um, my background is also in mental and behavioral health and education. So I, I am a former case manager and I work with pregnant women and substance abuse. So something that I thought was really interesting when I began that work was when I began to learn that there was what addiction actually meant um, because there was so much stigma around it. And I was working from my very limited lens, honestly, of what that looked like. But in the work that I was doing and all of the education and the courses that I had to take definitely for certification and the work that I was doing, something that I learned was that there was a difference between physical and psychological addictions. Mm -hmm. And I thought that that was really important in my foundational learning once I understood that, because once I understood like, oh, wait, so anybody can be addicted to anything it is based on, you know, these certain things. Um, I think something that's really important, I would think, for the community to know um, and to understand is the difference between physical and psychological addiction. So, Keeper, could you share um, some of that information with us? Sure. And I think I, I kind of want to step away from like being a nurse and like being the professional here and talk about my own experiences um, in my life. And I had a lifetime of a, a, a father with addiction issues. And I saw um, his highs and his lows and his struggles uh, throughout his life. But what always struck me, I had an aunt who overdosed and died uh, when I was about six years old. It was so, she was like one of my favorite people. Anyway, my father, I just knew, and, and it's so funny that at a very, at six, seven, eight years old, I knew my father was in the throes of addiction for several reasons, but I knew when she died, that was going to change it. And it didn't. And I was like, how could that not make him stop using drugs? Like he just saw his baby sister die. And like, from, so from a very young age, like I knew a couple of things. I knew that it wasn't something he had control over. <laughs> completely because if he did anyone in his right mind would have stopped immediately and number two I knew that it was something that I had to guard myself <laughs> for because this was my father and so much of me is in him and I saw a lot of myself in him in, in so many ways and so you know it just really helped me feel differently about people who struggle from a very young age um so of course uh yes to me that those my father is a, has a psychological addiction to 
a lot of things, money to drugs, to women, you know, there were, there were a lot of things. And I think that that was over, was part of his personality and part of who he was as a person and part of what he passed down to me. And so, you know, I, I definitely see both ends of that. Of course, you know, when you have someone who is physically dependent and they no longer are being given what they need to that they're dependent upon you know you see the withdrawal symptoms you see the physical um reaction to no longer being fed their addiction being fed but the psychological portion you know once people get through withdrawals and, and those symptoms then they have to deal with what's going on in the mind and that is really where um, I feel the the struggle and and the the difficulty is for people breaking the cycle of addiction. Thank you so so much for that, Keeper. Thank you so much for sharing your story as well, um, and actually like painting the real picture of what that looks like, what psychological addictions look like, what physical addictions look like. Um, I'm not sure, uh, Dr. McNabb, do you have anything to add that you would like to add regarding the difference between physical and psychological addictions? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, thank you, Kiba, for sharing your story. And I just wrote down um, when after addiction, you know, when after you're dealing with that acute, like sort of um, how do you deal with that post, um, you know, recovery? And that's where I think, you know, cannabis a lot of time can fit in as well, right? So to keep people, um, one, mitigate withdrawal symptoms and then, um, you know, kind of elevate people's mood and kind of um, also provide an alternative there. Um, yeah, I mean, I think you hit hit on the really key points that, you know, there's physical addictions and there are certain drugs that and substances that are known to cause that, right? So opioids, benzos, barbiturates, alcohol, nicotine, and then there are other, you know, psychological addictions. So that could be gambling, sex, anything that a, high, a runner's high, right? Um, and so understanding that addiction in itself and physical addiction um, sometimes, you know, can um, progress and you need to think about um, treatment as multi-pronged approach to what, what Kiefer was saying. So you have a, either a physical withdrawal, so how do you mitigate some of those withdrawal symptoms, um, but then how do you maintain um, off of those kinds of substances with a variety of interventions? So um, I think it's also unique to individuals and understanding that Right now, and with COVID, and there's a real shortage of healthcare providers out there, um, sometimes it's like an eight-month wait. So being kind and thinking about alternative uh, frontline workers. Anyway, I'm going down into other areas, but um, <laughs> how, how do we address it? But yeah, I think, I think it's important to um, understand the difference between a physical addiction and then a psychological one. Awesome. Um, so according to the National Center for Health Statistics, uh, this is some interesting research that I came across. Um, during a 12 month period ending in April, 2021, drug overdose deaths increased by 28.5%, which resulted in an estimated 100,000 plus fatalities. Of those 100 plus thousand deaths, an estimated 75,673 were the result of opioid overdoses. Ironically, or not ironically, um, also in 2021, there was an increase in synthetic opioids, uh, which is primarily fentanyl, uh, psychostimulants, for example, methamphetamines, cocaine, natural and synthetic opioid pain-related overdose deaths. So, there were a lot of opioid related deaths last year, quite frankly. Um, Tamika, this question is for you. How can cannabis aid in the opioid epidemic? Thank you, Tashonda. Yes, the opioid epidemic is such a really, really prevalent situation that's going on right now. Um, a lot of times I tell my clients it's, you know, basically helping people, cannabis can help people combat those symptoms, those um, physical addiction symptoms that we was just talking about. A lot of times there's, a, there's individuals who are suffering. They, they wanna um, stop using, but they suffer from those 
physical effects of the addiction, like the withdrawal and the, the pain, nausea and vomiting, things like that, that they go through when they're trying to leave these negative substances alone. So I tell people that cannabis can be used as an alternative medicine in helping individuals manage those symptoms. Cannabis is, is, has been shown in the research to, to help s s tremendously with nausea, vomiting, pain management. Um, even for myself, I've used cannabis um, after I've had a surgery and I've used it for pain um, management as well. So cannabis in, in that aspect, um, helping individuals with their, their, their shift from opioid use is, is, is a really good thing, can be very helpful. It's interesting that you talked about it um, and, and, and spoke of the recovery aspect as it retains to just surgery. So regular medical procedures. Um, I've actually, I've, I've, I happen to be in relationship with quite a few people who have made the choice to use CBD um, and to use other cannabis products for recovery purposes. Um, I also happen to have a relationship with those who have had cosmetic surgery, you know, elective surgery, and they do the same thing. So when you're going, I also notice when you go into those offices now, you'll see a nice little case where they have CBD products that they are willing to sell you. So, and also in CVS, they're there. And also in the grocery stores, I'm noticing that you see a lot of CBD products. So it's becoming, you know, widely accessible to folks, but there's still, again, so much stigma, I think, and miseducation and lack of education that folks don't understand. So like to actually understand that, no, this plant is really, really holistic and there's so many medicinal benefits to it. Um, and then, to also understand that those who are in the mental and behavioral health, you know, community in a way, and that you may have a disorder, you may suffer from certain symptoms to understand that this plant also may be a valuable option to you. Um, so thank you so much for sharing that. Kiba, did you have anything that you wanted to add as it related to actually using um, cannabis as an aid um, in the opioid epidemic? epidemic, especially hearing those staggering statistics that we just uh, shared. Yeah, I, I just wanted to point something out because we're having a community conversation, right? And we're keeping it real, right? So in our community, we thought the opioid crisis was the other folks' problem. And it is really becoming a problem in our community. And I think it is because, A, we haven't really had community conversations about opioids and us, you know, it's always been like relative to what's happening to others. But I think we really need to start having conversations about opioids and us and uh, what these drugs are and then educating people about cannabis in different ways. You know, one of the, one of the things that I always, you know, when people say, oh, you know, look at that boy, all he does is smoke weed. He's always high, he's always doped up. And I always say, I wonder what's going on with him to have to always want to be like that, you know, or to have to always want to be in it. And, and, and I bet you if I could talk to him and help him, you know, learn how to medicate properly and understand, you know, what he's doing, why he's doing it and how he can do it so that he can be functional, it would, you know, his life would be better. And I say all that to say the same goes with cannabis and the opioid crisis. People don't understand the correlation. They don't see that. Yes, the reason why we we can use cannabis is because if someone like like uh, Tamika said is in withdrawal, we can give them dabs and RSO and help them get through that time, you know. But people don't understand that, and so I think we really need to start like keep having a real conversation. Opioids affects us too. <laughs> um, and, and we need to understand what these drugs are. People still don't know what fentanyl is, how it can come, like how it can, that it can be mixed up. People are looking for patches, you know, and that's not what it is. And so I, I think we need to break a lot of that down for our community. <clears throat> I think the other important note here is when we talk about actually having access to a safe um, and tested and regulated product and what that means. 
because that that means that individuals in our community need access to medicinal cannabis. They need access to, when we talk about adult use, I think about those folks who may not necessarily have the means to go through the process to get their actual recommendations and et cetera. And I think about those folks who are still, you know, connecting with individuals on the legacy market. When we talk about how fentanyl is actually getting into these drugs, that's the way it's doing because it's not a safe, regulated, and tested product. That doesn't happen in those cases because, again, that doesn't show. If it shows up, you got to go. And not only that, you're going to be shut down and a lot, everybody's going to jail. That's just how that works. So, but that doesn't happen in the legacy market. Um, but also, like you talked about, like understanding what it, what terpenes are, understanding, you know, what your um, predispositions are based on your family history, understanding. And, I, and again, I'm having this conversation and I'm saying these things and I very much want our community to understand that I know that I'm coming from a place of privilege. To even be in this place to understand and be able to have this conversation is because one, I myself, and I've disclosed this plenty of times before, I have my own mental and behavioral health disorder. I was on psychotropics and I did not like the symptoms. And I literally had to titrate myself off of them. I educated myself on cannabis and I moved to a state where it was actually regulated and I could purchase it and I could become a patient. So I did the process that way, but I know that not everyone has access and not everyone is privileged to do that. However, we would like to meet you where you are and at least provide this information for you. So if nothing else, we'll get to what we can do later, but this is a part of advocacy. Understanding what this plant can do, understanding that is when we talk about least harm approach, when we talk about what is accessible, because I'm going to be honest, if we're talking about taking things off that are, you know, take or regulating things or, or, or make it pro, I guess, prohibiting things that are hurting our communities, I want all sodas banned. I want all the sugary crap that's on, you know, the cheap foods that are affordable, but folks live in food deserts and this is what they can afford. And it's killing us. Diabetes is really killing us, like really. High blood pressure is really killing us. Like cancer is really killing us. And to understand that, hey, sugar's perfectly fine. And we talk about psychological and physical addictions, right? Have you seen what people do when they go through caffeine withdrawals? But that's perfectly legal, like that's fine. I know friends who throw back espressos, like everything's all right. And if they don't get it, they got the shakes. Now, if it was if it was a drug, right? If it was a pain medication, you know how it is, Kira, Tamika, Dr. McNabb, we'd be like, oh, it's something wrong with them. Mm, there's, there's, you, they need some help. Like it's obviously something wrong. And if you're not educated, you're like, you might be nervous because you don't know, right? But it's, again, understanding the differences here, knowing what it means, again, to be physically and psychologically addicted to something, understanding what it means to have access to holistic care, understanding what it means to advocate if you don't, understanding what it means to advocate if you do, but knowing others don't. So I'm, I'm just glad that we are here having this conversation. I'm sorry I got carried away. It's just, it's just spiraled, but thank you so much for entertaining me. Um, so the next question that I have, Dr. Marion, actually is for you. Um, what role do you think cannabis can play in addiction recovery and mental health treatment? Yeah, that's a, um, and thank you for all those thoughts, Deshonda. I mean, uh, you know, and I, it, you made some very valuable um, points to say. Um, you know, I think cannabis can play um, in addiction recovery and treatment, I think three different roles. And actually I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and paste a, um, a paper that I found earlier. I was doing a little bit of research prior to the event. Um, so I'm gonna paste this in the chat, but it really looks at um, trying to understand the evidence-based um, role of cannabis in the opioid epidemic from three different perspectives. So. Prior to the introduction of cannabis as, I mean, opioids as a treatment, you know, so could cannabis be a substitute for chronic pain? So instead of front, first line therapy, you know, prescribing um, an opioid, uh, can medical cannabis be first line? Um, the second being opioid reduction as a strategy for those already, you know, consuming opioids. So if you have medical cannabis introduced, 
um, you know, uh, lowering the doses of the necessary opioids to meet that, you know, sort of pain relief threshold that you're looking for. And then the third area is, you know, medical cannabis is an adjunct therapy to methadone or suboxone treatment to increase treatment success rates and improve those withdrawal symptoms. Um, but again, you know, like having these providers in uh, med medication assisted treatment programs or MAT programs know about medical cannabis and these risks and benefits and other, you know, potential drug drug interactions that, you know, um, Kibra and Tamika might know more about as, um, you know, direct care providers. I think, you know, there's evidence from a prevention standpoint, right? So like, let's put medical cannabis as first line therapy um, in the, you know, substitution phase and then, you know, potentially the maintenance phase. Um, so, but I also, so in the, in the studies that I've conducted, you know, majority of uh, patients are, you know, reporting relief for mental health or psychological conditions. So that's anywhere from anxiety, depression, PTSD, um, and more and more these days with COVID, increasing trauma. And, um, you know, currently I'm running a medical cannabis um, uh, knowledge, attitude, and practice study related to, for healthcare providers. And we actually ask the healthcare providers, what role they think medical cannabis can play. And 70% 70, 70 of 354 providers um, agree that cannabis can be a tool to be used to address the opioid epidemic. So although um, these healthcare providers that, you know, reported in the study, 60% have received formal training related medical cannabis. So it's a pretty educated, um, you know, community of providers, but still there's um, you know, from at least that that perspective in this study sample, uh, folks agree that it's important um, and can play a role. Oh, wow. So, so basically what we're saying is, you know, I, I used to hear this great um, parable and it, used to, and it, it was um, those who are closest to the problem know the solutions. So to hear that those who are on the front lines every day doing the work, like absolutely believe that cannabis has efficacy and could definitely support, um, again, a, a lot of what's going on with folks as far as it, it pertains, as it pertains to mental health issues and, and actual like other like recovery related needs, et cetera. Like it's, it's, it's a, <laughs> it's good to hear but also, you know, on the other side, it's like, wow, like, why is progress so slow? Like, why is this so slow? Um, but again, we know that there are a lot of, a lot of other um, forces at work there. But that's another panel. That's not tonight. We'll talk about that another time. But thank you so much for that. Um, so the next question that I have is, um, it's actually for you, Tanika. So those studies have typically shown cannabis is non-habit forming physically. How do we ensure patients and clients aren't substituting one dependency for another? Right, and that does happen, but I wanted to jump back a minute and talk about what happens in recovery um, before I get to that question, if that's okay. A okay. lot of times, um, individuals who are addicted and they've been using for years and years and years, it really destroys what goes on in their body, even down to a cellular level. So using cannabis, the, the way that cannabis helps in that recovery, cannabis helps the process to help the body reach homeostasis, a balance, you know? So what cannabis does, it, it, it helps the nerves and the cells communicate with each other so that they can produce, so it helps the, the body produce a more healthier balance. So um, it's, it's, it's really, really helpful when you're thinking about it on that level. As far as moving from one dependency to another, a lot of times that happens, sometimes that happens um, because a lot, of, a lot of people are still holding on to pain or whatever they're dealing with. So I, I, I always say, you know, encourage clients to get connected to care, um, especially care that deals with the whole person holistically. You know, you want people to be able to have help physically. You want them to be able to have help mentally. 
You want them to even have help socially. How do they, they, they've been addicted. They've been on the street. They've been homeless. How are they socially going to reintroduce themselves back into the population? And even on a spiritual level, you, you want to be able to make sure that your clients are connected to care so that they can get the supports in the, in, in, the, in, in those supports that they're going to need, especially when they're in recovery, because, when you're in addiction, you have the the drug or the substance or whatever it is, it's masking, it's, it's, you know, putting the cover on a lot of personal issues that people are dealing with. And then when you remove the substance and you remove the drugs and the body is now trying to get, get itself back healthy, all these things are coming up too. You're going to have depression. You're going to have pain. You're going to have all these things. Um, so, so having those connections to care is, is, is really, really, really important. So definitely taking the whole person approach, like being person-centered and understanding that they're going to need supports in many other areas. It's not just about that physical or psychological dependency, but understanding how that has impacted their relationships um, their engagement in everyday life, um, and even understanding having, a, I've seen certain um, folks in recovery and what that looks like for their activities of daily living. So just taking showers, like just being able to do regular hygiene, you know, take care of their hygiene regularly. It's, it's, it's a real difficult feat to do um, so to understand that cannabis can be introduced and actually help your body like sort of restore itself, if you will, um, is really, really encouraging to know. Um, and then the other pieces is many of the, I've seen a lot of the side effects, like, you know, of actual folks coming out of addiction. So if you've ever seen anyone coming out of withdrawal, it will, it going through withdrawals, it will completely change your perspective, I think, on actual like dependency and what that looks like. Um, so to know that it can actually, cannabis can actually treat a lot of those symptoms. So when you're talking about nausea, right? We're talking about um, physical aches and pains like you shared, it's, it's really encouraging to know that folks can have that. And then on the mental and behavioral health side, right? Which is, and it's interesting because I know that addiction falls under that umbrella, but I don't know if our community understands that, that when we talk about addiction, that is a component of mental and behavioral health. Um, so to understand that it, it's, again, it's all together. Um, and so to know what that looks like with folks who are in depression, right? So I've seen folks who are sort of, if um, you see them going through like manic depressive states, I've seen them when they're at the real like low bottoms, but then I've also seen them do some micro dosing. And then it's just like, hey, well, it's good to see you back. Like, welcome back. You know, it's not a miracle. No, there's no miracle, but you see a shift. So it's, it's, it's nice to see that. And then, but then I've also seen those same individuals on their psychotropics and it's not quite the same. Um, but then I've seen some folks who use the two together and they seem to support one another. So it's like, you, you know, it helps sort of mitigate the symptoms from the psychotropics. So again, being able to work with the healthcare professionals and with your mental health providers um, is really important in this process. Um, but unfortunately, Personally, we're having to do a lot of this work on our own um, based on access or lack of access. So um, I'm not sure. Uh, Kira, did you have anything that you wanted to add to that? Um, we I, oh, I just wanted to say, you know, I wanted to second what Tamika was saying about. Uh, so at Canna Health, uh, one of the number one diagnoses we saw was PTSD. Every, you know, almost everyone who came in, we diagnosed them, we evaluated them and diagnosed them with PTSD. And what was extremely important was that we connected them to services, that we made sure that they were referred to a therapist. We don't offer therapy. We made that very clear. And it was, a, it, it has always been a struggle for me to have people um, basically pouring out like the worst 
because you and when you're being evaluated for PTSD, you have to talk about your trauma. And, and usually you have to talk about the worst one that you could think of. So you have all these people pouring out all of their life stories and their traumas. And then we're like just sending it on their way. So it's always been a struggle for me, but we make sure that we get people connected. But what your question was, um, how do we make sure clients aren't substituting one dependency for another? I definitely want people to get healed. I definitely want people to be made whole, but I would much rather you have an addiction to cannabis, if it were so, than a lethal, to, than an addiction to a drug that would kill you. You know, I mean, that is where, where, where it could come down to it for some people, like my dad, like it was either cannabis or he was going to kill himself. You know, and so we got him in therapy and 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 utilizing uh, cannabis, but we got to talk about that. Like the op the other option is death. <laughs> you know, for some people. So understanding that, yes, in, in this case, in some cases, you may be substituting one addictive behavior for another, right? So you may be moving from an opioid to cannabis. However, the difference is is that cannabis is non toxic, right? So when we talk about those physical and psychological addictions, like, yeah, satiations, meaning, you know, just like cigarettes and just like eating certain things, like that satiation, that ease that we feel or, you know, constantly doing something, it's habit forming, right? So to substitute that with cannabis, given that it's non-toxic, it's like, okay, so these is like, it's the least of them all, right? And, 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 and it won't kill you. No one's ever OD'd on cannabis alone, my friends, not one. Look it up, research it from the beginning of time. No one has ever, ever, ever consumed so much cannabis that they died. It's never happened, never happened. They may pass out, they may clear out your pantry. <laughs> <laughs> they may get the giggles, but that's it. That's that's pretty much as far. Well, some people do get paranoid. That's a whole other thing. Say, they might have a whole anxiety about. attack, <laughs> but they still exactly. won't. Die. Exactly. You know, you need to stay away from certain terpenes and things like that. But that's a part of doing the research. Again, consume responsibly. We we encourage that here at Elevate, as I'm sure all of our panelists do. Consume responsibly. Um, so. <laughs> Hydrate, hydrate, hydrate. And if you ever consume too much peppercorns, water, make sure you're in a relaxed environment. Yes, there are different things you can do. You can Google them. They'll tell you. It's not milk. That old adage of milk and all that is not going to happen. It's not. And if you're lactose intolerant, you just ruined your entire life. Like, it's not even worth it. Now you're paranoid <laughs> in the bathroom. <laughs> exactly. You're paranoid and your stomach's upset. This is not going to work out. <laughs> Um, um, so the next question that we actually have, oh, Keeper, this is for you. So we were just talking about what needs to happen so that we can make things accessible. So the question is, is what measures would need to be in place to ensure cannabis treatment is accessible to all demographics and being careful to avoid current healthcare disparities? Mm -hmm. You know, well, I, I'm a firm believer in the fact that cannabis should be one of the first options offered to people. You know, a lot of times I, people have come to me or, 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 or I've heard of stories where people are like, I tried everything. And now they're on their last leg and then they try cannabis and then they get five good days left in their life, you know, and I, and I work with a lot of hospice patients, you know, so, so I really would like for cannabis to be the first thing that is one of the options offered to people. I think if that is, if that with education, with knowledge, with insight, if, if that happens, we would see such a difference probably in so many ways. But, you know, I think that that definitely has to happen. What did you say? And then thinking about disparities and demographics, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, becoming a medical cannabis patient is it, it kind of helps to even that playing field, you know, now you're protected, your job is protected, your, your, uh, you know, your home is protected in, in ways that it wasn't and you don't, you don't, you won't get violated. And so I do think that 
um, just making it, making, getting the certification accessible, making sure it's affordable. I saw someone had put in the chat that, you know, it's unfortunate that a lot of people who are struggling with the dish addiction, well, some of the people, because I'm not going to say a lot, because it happens across all economic uh, lines. But, you know, some people who are struggling with addiction can't afford cannabis because it's not covered by insurance and, and the process is not covered to become a patient is not covered. And so that creates a whole nother issue. Here it is. I want, I don't want Suboxone. I don't want methadone, but this is what my insurance will cover, you know? And so that should not be the case. Like we need to find ways to make it accessible for people, no matter what their financial um, uh, life is. <laughs> oh, and just kudos to, to you too, uh, Kiever, because I think it's important to note. Um, one, of the, um, one of the many things that I've always loved about you and that impressed me about you and your model um, was when we talked about sliding scale and you told me what you were doing at Canna Health, where you were actually meeting people where they were. So what they could afford to pay, you're allowing them to pay for their recommendations so they could at least have access to it. And that when we talk about what you can do, and yes, Tamika, yes, that's, that's clap. See, you, Kiri, you deserve a standing ovation too. I told you, each one of you ladies, <laughs> just kudos, kudos, bravo, bravo. Yes, um, but that absolutely is amazing. Like it, it's just meeting people where they are um, and then still too, and all the work that you're doing, I've still seen your blessings pour in. So you have not gone broke, you know? And, and I know that your riches are, are not in material things. I know it's in the impact that you make and I want you to know that you're doing that. So thank you for continuing to show up for us. Like seriously, like you're bringing some real healing and health to our communities, like, and, and it's so needed. So thank you so much for that. Thank each and every one of you ladies for doing that because you each and every one of you are. Um, so the other thing that I have, and this is going to be the last question that we have, and, and I'll take a look to see if we have any in chat, um, is, you know, I'm always about action items, right? At Elevate, we always talk about action items. So we can't just talk about the problems. We have to present and provide solutions, right? So how can advocates, mental and behavioral health, and public education professionals and regular, not regular, but amazing everyday community members effectively support cannabis as a treatment for addiction or long-term recovery? What can we do? Um, Dr. McNabb, would you like to take that question for us first? Yeah, thank you. And I think, you know, Kibra ended um, uh, her last amazing, brilliant points with a very good point that, you know, um, although this alternative is there, um, there's, uh, it's expensive and we need to have insurance, you know, cover it. So thinking about how everybody can share their own story and how it's benefited them, um, testify in front of your um, legislators. It does make a difference, although maybe sometimes it feels like it doesn't, um, but it does. Your story does make a difference in lawmakers' minds. Um, so I would say uh, get up there, share your story, uh, try and advocate and share what you're doing with your healthcare provider. Um, I, I agree with you also, Kubra, in the research study. Um, I. 37% of the doctors and the clinicians agree with you that cannabis should be a first line treatment. So um, having people continuing to say that and saying, you know, this is my first line therapy, I choose this over a pill, over an opioid is really important. And, um, you know, the other, one of the key data points I found in the last five years, people have always been concerned about uh, cannabis diversion to young people. And I think that that's an important point to continue to be aware of, but 30% of the veterans in a veterans health and medical cannabis study that I conducted with colleagues that had over 400 veterans reporting, 30% of them had opioids at their home that they didn't want to, or prescription meds at their home they they didn't use and that they don't know how to get rid of. So that when we're talking about non-lethal alternatives versus what's more lethal at the home and really driving the dialogue around harm reduction and cannabis being a harm reduction alternative. Um, it may not be 
you know, a completely benign or CBD non-psychoactive all the time, but it's, it's less lethal. It's a, a less harmful substance. So I think we can all um, also be very compassionate these days because uh, more and more with the fentanyl, um, you know, uh, outbreaks, it's really, really, um, you know, really exacerbating the opioid epidemic, in my opinion, in terms of like um, really increasing overdoses. So compassion, there's not a lot of mental health care professionals out there. It's stressful for a lot of people with COVID. So have, have compassion for everybody around. And, um, you know, um, I would say get involved where you can and um, yeah try and, um, you know, support medical cannabis. Um, it's not for everybody, but it's a viable alternative. Yes. And, and Dr. McNabb, you, you touched on something that's really important when we talked about um, children and ensuring that adolescents don't have access to this. I think that that's really important as well. But I, it, it's also, I think, important for us to know that there's actually data yes. now that medical shows cannabis. It. Ah, <laughs> gotcha, medical gotcha. cannabis. <laughs> yeah, <Sorry. laughs> different, right? Different for you. Yeah, um, yeah, so that's totally a, a different realm, right? Um, but as far as just everyday access, and we're talking about um, maybe cannabis that you know wasn't put in a, a safe box or a lock box, you know, according to regulations and what we're supposed to do, right? Law, um, but children are having access to it. It's actually proven now that like because this is regulated, like children are, there's, they're not having any more access to this than they did previously, like current day. So in states where medical cannabis is available and or even apparently adult use based on the requirements and it's regulated, they don't have access to it. So yeah, just like absolutely. you can't have kids go in and buy alcohol, they can't go in and buy cigarettes, they can't go in and buy cannabis. It's not yeah, alcohol. no, it's definitely, you got a couple of IDs to get in the door. And I think you made a very <laughs> important point, and I brought this up at an advisory board meeting recently about medical cannabis for pediatrics and really being thoughtful about the language about youth prevention versus when youth really need to have access in schools to reduce seizures because that's a thing and um, other pediatric conditions. So uh, we have to be really thoughtful about how we communicate about cannabis and when it's recreational, medical, um, and, and yeah, yeah. No worries, thank you so much for that. Um, so Tamika, do you have anything to share with us as it relates to what we can do as a community, what we can do as mental and behavioral health professionals? Um, to actually um, advocate and, and, and to encourage, you know, the access, access to cannabis. Yes, I, I absolutely love what Dr. McNabb said about sharing our stories. Um, a lot of us have our own individual stories that we can tell surrounding cannabis and how we use it or its use, how it affects us. And I think that by us sharing those stories, and in particular, those of us like me who are in the field and you all that's in the field, doctors, psychiatrists, clinicians, counselors, um, recovery coaches, if we can normalize that cannabis conversation, come out green. You heard the expression, come out green, share your story. I'm a, I'm a cannabis consumer as, as a medical professional, as a mental health professional, as a substance use counselor. I'm coming out green to you. I'm going to come out green to my clients. I'm going to come out green to my family and my friends. And we're going to have and keep the, having these discussions. And, and, and if we do that, especially us in, on, on this level, if we do that, it, it, it can be a really good, wonderful thing for cannabis in, in making that shift to, um, you know, destigmatizing and, and and being more welcoming and being more open to a lot of populations, a lot of demographics. Awesome. Well, thank you, ladies, so much for your words of wisdom, for sharing your knowledge, for sharing your experience with us this evening. Um, I've been going through the chat and taking a look. We don't have any questions. Um, we have quite a bit of individuals sharing their experience. Um, as well as there's also resources that have been added as well. So we encourage everyone to take a look there. Um, again, we're all about sharing the knowledge, um, elevating the understanding um, in the community. So I, I, I wanna thank you again, Tamika, 
Dr. McNabb, Nurse Kira, <laughs> for being with us this evening. Um, and, and honestly, for just standing in the gap for the work that you do each and every single day. Um, I know that the fight is not, e it's not easy. Um, it often feels like, you know, we're, we're battling and we're in a fight, we're uphill with roller skates on. Um, but at the same time, you know, each little bit that we are doing individually is making such a huge impact and the difference. So I just want to thank you for everything from the bottom of my heart that you do for us as a people. So thank you so much. Um, I want to thank my peers at Elevate. Thank you so much for all the hard work um, that was put in behind, to, behind the scenes to make this possible. Um, our community conversation uh, events are specifically um, and are exactly that. They're for the community. We do our best um, to put together programming um, that will educate each and every one, um, that will elevate each and every one, and that provides opportunity um, as well. So thank you, each and every one, for joining us this evening. We appreciate you. Um, and we hope to see you soon for our next installment. Have a wonderful evening and take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank Thanks you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, ladies, so, so, so much. Good night. Good night.